It's my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Usha Tamalanara, who has a PhD, and she is Associate Professor in the Department of Counseling, Development, and Educational Psychology at Boston College. She's also an independent practice in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Her scholarship focuses on immigration, trauma, and cultural competence, and psychoanalytic psychotherapy. She has served as the chair of the Multicultural Concerns Committee and as member at large in APA Division 39 Psychoanalysis, and as a member of the APA Committee on Ethnic Minority Affairs, the APA Presidential Task Force on Immigration, and the APA Task Force on Revising the Multicultural Guidelines. She is also the author of Psychoanalytic Theory and Cultural Competence in Psychotherapy, published by APA Books in January 2016. And as we've already mentioned in psychoanalysis, we still seem to be a little bit behind when it comes to culture. So we're so thankful for that book. So will you please uh, welcome with me uh, Dr. Tumala Nara. Good afternoon, everybody. Everybody's still hanging in there. <laughs> towards the end of the day. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about the intersection of Hindu spirituality, Hinduism, and psychoanalytic psychotherapy as I've experienced it um, in my own personal journey, but as a psychotherapist. And um, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to be shifting back and forth a bit today between sharing with you some basic ideas in Hindu philosophy um, and the world of psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic psychotherapy. So if you feel like I'm going back and forth, it's because it's very reflective of my own process and, the, and my own journey with respect to this, because it's been um, not the easiest uh, journey in some ways, or the most simple journey. So um, please take that shifting as reflective of something deeper. That, and I really see this as um, this type of integration as a work in progress for myself um, as a clinician. Um, okay, so while the positivism of classical psychoanalysis and the subjectivity of spiritual beliefs um, have often contradicted each other, these two areas of inquiry share some common goals, including the attempt to make meaning, uh, the emphasis on awareness of one's own or a client's experience, and the individual's transformation to a greater sense of authenticity. However, we come to these goals in very different ways sometimes. And so my presentation today, what I'm going to do is explore this intersection. But I'll begin by presenting some basic concepts in Hinduism. And I'm not going to assume that you know everything about Hindu philosophy. But I thought that this might be helpful just to sort of give some background to it. And then I'll discuss some developments in psychoanalysis and also in feminist discourse and in multicultural psychology that I think are helpful in, in this um, type of integrative work. Then I'm going to explore the question of how religious practices and psychoanalytic inquiry can either provide a sense of safety and meaning or contribute to feelings of anxiety and oppression, and specifically related to women in the immigrant context. So I will then focus it in on that specific topic today. And I'm going to present some case material that will hopefully illustrate some of these points that I'm making. Um, I should also say that in terms of my own personal uh, journey, I come to this work as a Hindu Indian American psychologist, as a child immigrant to the United States, um, one who has um, immersed in my own spiritual faith, but has done so with love and with ambivalence. And I would say the same thing about psychoanalysis, that I have love and I have ambivalence. <laughs> and this is something that I continue to work through um, in this journey of integration. Um, but I also think you know, it's important to point out that these feelings of love and ambivalence that I've had um, with spirituality and psychoanalysis, I believe, have helped me to think critically, but also immerse further and deeper into the work. Um, there are many different interpretations of, um, uh, of psychoanalytic um, you know, traditions, but there are also many different interpretations of Hindu spiritual philosophy. And so here is just a quick sort of rundown um, of some basic ideas. So as a background, Hinduism um, is rooted way back in ancient times, um, and 
in a set of scriptures called the Vedas. And there are four major Vedas, um, Rig, Yajur, Sama, and Atharva. And along with that, other scriptures called the Upanishads. And these focus on meditative and spiritual knowledge. Um, there's a long history uh, within this scriptures and of learning in the oral tradition, a relational history that is rooted in the relationship between a guru or a teacher um, or a sage and um, disciples. And so this is um, a long-standing kind of tradition that we see over and over again as a theme of Hindu spirituality and practice. Um, the, a major scripture which has influence today um, is the Bhagavad Gita. And this you may have heard of, it's very common, commonly known. Um, but here, the Bhagavad Gita is situated in a larger epic, and you'll see two epics up here that are most well known in Hindu philosophy, which is the Ramayana, written by Valmiki, and others, other versions as well, and Mahabharata, which was um, written by Vyasa, Sage Vyasa. Um, so this, these epics are uh, not just stories, but they actually are emblematic. They reflect a sensibility, both in terms of spirituality and culture, around cultural ideals, ideals of human beings, human life, aspirations that one might have. Um, and the Bhagavad Gita is situated in the second epic that you see here, the Mahabharata. And essentially, Bhagavad, the Bhagavad Gita in Sanskrit, right, to English, translates to the Song of the Lord or Song of God which was recited, it was a set of teachings that was imparted by um, uh, a god who comes in human form um, called Krishna. And he, Krishna, is give, delivering um, teachings, spiritual teachings, to, a, to his student, to his beloved student, Arjuna, who's a warrior. And Arjuna is faced with this impossible bind of trying to fight in a war um, with his cousins and his family members. So this is an internal battle, quite literally and figuratively, within a family over land and resources and, and power. And, um, and he and his brothers have been unjustly treated, as the epic goes, by the other side. And so here is Arjuna saying, I cannot fight. How can I fight my own self, essentially? How can I fight my own family? And so this set of scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, situates, it's a conversation between a guru and a disciple. So this tradition is very common, and it's something that's internalized by uh, many Hindus in this idea of learning about spirituality, that there is some other figure, that it's not just an internal process or an external process, but it's actually a relational process. Um, there are very, um, you know, there's some really interesting misconceptions of what God is in Hinduism. Oftentimes, I've gotten questions like, well, aren't there thousands of gods in Hinduism, and aren't there, you know, and I've never quite learned it that way in my own family or in my tradition. Um, so I've always learned that there's one God, um, and so in traditional Hinduism, there is uh, this concept of Brahman, or one uni unified God, and from God, I think of it as layers in, um, in, in terms of manifestations of God. Uh, so from God, from this Brahman, comes um, this idea of um, Om, or kind of a union, um, and there is a feminine and a masculine kind of union. And from that come the Trinity, the Hindu Trinity, which is uh, includes both masculine forms as well as feminine forms. And so the gods in the Trinity, you may have heard these names like Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Um, and then the goddesses, Saraswati, Lakshmi, and Parvati, who are aligned with each of these gods in respective ways. And so these, um, so right from the beginning, there's this kind of merging and coexistence of the masculine and the feminine in Hinduism. There's also differences. Again, these are interpreted in various forms in Hinduism. There's no single Hinduism, just like there isn't a singular um, Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism um, or Islam. And um, so in Advaita philosophy, there are two different 
ways of thinking about um, God forms and the existence of God. Advaita is a non-dualistic kind of approach um, where you have the, um, th this belief that you are both, um, that God resides in you as well as external to you. There's this sort of um, non-dualistic kind of um, approach. Dvaita is more dualistic than some folks believing that God is really external, someone you pray to, or a being that you pray to. So there are differences in this. But when you say namaste, which is the greeting of Hindus, um, that it is from the Advaita philosophy, where you see that you are basically greeting the divine self of you is greeting the divine self in someone else. This is a non-dualistic kind of uh, thinking. Um, so there are many paths to God, this idea of Brahman or God. And um, so there are, and Hinduism, in Hinduism it's interesting because there's a belief in that, that human beings have different temperaments and different inclinations. And so because of that, um, there are various paths to reaching God, different paths to liberation as we call it. Um, and so these are four that you see up here, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, and raja yoga. And all of these paths, as you can see, I'll just talk about a couple of examples. The first path that you see is jnana yoga, which is the path of knowledge. So this is um, more intellectual thinking um, and engaging the intellect. Bhakti yoga is more around devotion and love. Um, and so this involves prayer. Uh, so the kind of practices you engage in kind of uh, align with these particular inclinations. Karma yoga being the path of work and service. So um, doing work without expecting fruits of the action itself. There are also different developmental um, stages in Hinduism. So uh, Hindus often, you know, they sort of think about different stages in which spirituality can look different depending on your particular stage of life. Like when you're a student, um, you focus on development of um, learning and developing your character. Um, as a householder, your focus is on family life or on work life or in helping your community. And then there's retirement where you gradually turn inward. So you move from this kind of external um, orientation into gradually moving into um, an inward orientation. Um, there's also the belief in karma and reincarnation. So um, in Hinduism, there's a philosophy around how the soul develops. What is the development of the soul? So I always think of Hinduism as a developmental model, just as much of a, as a, a spiritual growth kind of model. Um, so there's, a, uh, there, there's the belief that actions in past lives contribute to what one experiences in the present. And what we do now affects what will come in the future. So there's no end and there's no beginning in Hindu philosophy. There's no sort of, it, it's circular. And um, you know, this, so this notion of the circle that Pilar had talked about is very uh, resonant with this kind of thinking. But eventually, there's a progression that happens, ideally, towards enlightenment or union with the divine. And this largely depends on our free will. Um, and so, which means that we make choices. We make choices that lead us to uh, good action, to positive action, to bringing out positive uh, deeds. Um, and this eventually leads to liberation, back to those paths to liberation. Um, the caste system has also been a part of the um, Hindu, uh, Hinduism, and um, this is the last slide I'll show you for now. I just figured I'll, cut, I'll just kind of touch on these things and then get back to some of these things a little bit later on. Um, this was an, a very old system. As you can see, it evolved in the second millennium BCE. And, um, and this was similar to those paths of liberation, um, was thought initially um, as a system that suited one's particular interest or inclination towards an occupation. Um, so there were four castes original, originally, the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras. So the Brahmins were the people who focused on uh, the intellectual learning um, and knowledge and teaching. The Kshatriyas were warriors, people who defended communities. Um, the Vaishyas were engaged in trade, in uh, merchant um, kind of businesses, things like that. 
Um, the Shudras were involved in agriculture, service, those kinds of occupations. Um, so this, of course, has turned into a very complex system, which um, is rife with all kinds of problems in India, and I would say throughout the Indian diaspora as well, and the Hindu diaspora. Um, and uh, from that, centuries later, would come a fifth uh, class of individuals called the untouchables. Nobody really knows definitively where this idea of untouchables comes from. There are lots of different uh, theories among historians, um, but no definitive reason for why this developed as a separate uh, group of people who really carry no caste, in fact. Um, and uh, this remains a huge problem uh, in India and elsewhere and um, is the cause of um, discrimination, violence, and brutal uh, injustice um, towards people of lower caste. And so I will get to more of that in a moment. Um, but I want to turn, so I, now I told you I'm going to shift. So I'm going to turn to psychoanalysis. Um, and so this, just keep in mind, this is where I'm coming from. I was a Hindu before I became a psychoanalytic psychologist. <laughs> so I'm going to start with this and move into, um, so this is what I'm raised with, right? This is, this is the philosophy that is in my family. This is what I'm absorbing as a child, adolescent, and, and so on. And then begin to sort of separate, individuate somewhat in college. Uh, but continuing to read the Gita. Gita was very much a part of my college experience, my graduate school experience. But one of the things that um, happened in, uh, in college was this kind of experience, and I'm sure much earlier as well, this experience that we were not, in my community at least, we're not talking about certain things, certain aspects of human experience that I would hear over and over again um, within my own family, within my Indian community, within our temple. Um, and, uh, and so I was eager to learn more. I wanted to understand, and I thought that psychology would help me understand um, something more about human experience. Um, I really appreciated uh, what Ken uh, Pargament this morning brought up about his the pigeon. I love that um, because, because it felt a little bit like that when I went to grad school, although I didn't work with pigeons directly. Um, but there was this feeling that somehow you did your spiritual life somewhere else, and then you did psychology. And psychology was a science, and it was a particular way of conducting science. And back when I was in training, there was very little discussion of um, cultural diversity, religious diversity, race, immigration. There was almost nothing that we spoke about in our classes about that. There were no required diversity courses like we have now in graduate programs. So this was clearly a time that things felt completely separate, dichotomous. And so, all right, so I'll move us to psychoanalytic thinking. Um, I want to first begin by sharing, um, kind of walking us through um, classical psychoanalysis and the beginning of looking at Eastern, what's known as Eastern religions um, in Western literature. Um, religious and spiritual experience was interpreted by Sigmund Freud in his paper, the future of an illusion, as an illusion and as the universal obsessional neurosis of humanity. Freud further connected religion with the Oedipus complex, likening the father-child relationship to an individual's fantasies of God representations. Romain Roland, who was a poet and a biographer of the Indian Hindu saint Ramakrishna and his student Vivekananda, in his well-known correspondence to Freud, um, which began in about 1923, stated that Freud's interpretation of religion neglected the human sensation of eternity, a feeling of something limitless, unbounded, to which Freud indicated his own lack of discovery and apprehension of what he called the oceanic feeling in himself. In his correspondence with Roland, Freud interpreted the oceanic feeling as the preservation of narcissism and the Hindu concept of maya, which is like illusion, um, as both a rationalization of feelings of derealization and a useful means to the unconscious. Freud's ambivalence about what he experienced as foreign and potentially threatening to his establishment of psychoanalysis as a Western, modernist, and positivistic discipline is clearly expressed in his correspondence with his contemporaries. We have this well-documented 
In fact, his correspondence with an Indian psychiatrist, Girinder Shaker Bose, is illustrative of his difficulty with reconciling cultural nuances with the broader principles of human nature, which he was so concerned with. By 1914, Bose had developed his psychoanalytic ideas almost independently of Freud under British occupation in India. And he had um, published a book called uh, The Concept of Repression in 1921. And in a passage from his book, Bose stated the following. The aim of all reactions is to bring about a state of identity between the subject and the object. Now, of course, this statement, we can look back, and it's unknowingly anticipatory of contemporary relational and intersubjective psychoanalytic approaches. The correspondence between Bose and Freud, and this, the Bose-Freud correspondence continued for years. It lasted from 1921 to 1937. And Bose's daughter would actually go and visit Freud. Um, so this particular correspondence clearly highlights Freud's unwillingness to address cultural specifics of Bose's ideas. And he would write back very politely to Bose and say, well, maybe that's true for people in India, but it's not really true for other people. You know, so it sort of you know, it became this sort of insulated idea. Um, the interface of early psychoanalysis and Hindu mysticism and Eastern spirituality would then surface in the work of Carl Jung whose descent with Freud in part involved Jung's emphasis on the spiritual dimension of the psyche. His notion of religious, of religious experience is absolute and indisputable, and his concept of the collective unconscious stood in sharp contrast to Freud's diminution of religion. At the same time, Jung's conceptualization of Eastern spirituality has been criticized for romanticizing and exoticizing Eastern religious symbols and traditions and for being reductionistic. In fact, when he has, when Jung um, had written in his diaries, um, you know, you find excerpts um, during his stay in the American Southwest with the Taos um, uh, American Indians, and he w would write in his diaries that he was afraid of going native. You know, those were his words. So there was this deep ambivalence around what felt foreign and different and racially the other, um, sort of compounding this thinking around uh, religion and spirituality. Um, of course, we need to understand these attitudes, these beliefs, and these conceptualization um, in the context of anti-Semitism, in the context of the Nazi Holocaust, as been mentioned earlier, um, and trying to understand that people were um, clearly trying to develop a way of thinking that would, first of all, keep them safe, um, physically safe, uh, but also um, create some kind of universal structure of understanding human experience without the imposition, as it was seen, of spiritual life. Um, in, in early psychology, William James cautioned against reductionistic views of spirituality that relegated spiritual beliefs to biological or psychological underpinnings. And he would emphasize the role of mystical experiences and states of consciousness as the center of the study of spiritual psychology. But challenges to the early views on religion and spirituality within psychoanalysis would also come by analysts like Eric Fromm, who along with um, D.T. Suzuki, a Zen master, developed a synthesis of Buddhist philosophy and psychoanalysis that centered around concepts such as self-realization. Fromm would describe a distinction between authoritarian and humanistic religions where the former emphasized submission to a powerful authority and the latter emphasized man and his strength. Eric Erickson, too, would note the healing uh, potential of religion and would compare dreams and religious symbols, underscoring the role of religion and creativity. The work of humanistic and existential theorists, of course, added a whole new dimension to understanding spirituality, certainly Viktor Frankl's work. Um, the object relations theory in the 1950s and 60s would bring new psychoanalytic conceptualizations. Henry Guntrip, for example, a psychoanalyst who is also a congregational minister, conceptualized the aim of psychological interpretations as helping the patient to experience with full conscious awareness his own inner self and life. 
He suggested that religion could be taught to a child in a way that, we, that could stifle spontaneity and confirm subordination, as in the case of people who fear or hate God. On the other hand, religion could be taught to protect the right of the individual to be true to their own self. In this way, Guntrip extended primary object relations to an individual's relationship with an ultimate, all-embracing reality. Winnicott, also a psychoanalyst right, from the object relations school, proposed his concept of transitional space, which involves a mix of internal and external realities and where transitional objects are created in childhood. His perspective supports the potential for religious subjectivity. His concept of transitional objects and Guntrip's perspective on the individual's relationship, private relationship with God, is reflected in more recent object relations perspectives on internal God representations as paralleling the development of other early object relations. Ana Maria Rizzuto has written extensively about this. Interestingly, when I read about object relations perspectives on spirituality, and particularly Ana Maria Rizzuto's um, work, I, I, I went back to this over here, this idea that you could have all of these different relationships with different forms of God. So here I was beginning to sort of integrate in my own mind, well, are there particular God images within Hinduism that felt more personally relevant to me that I could relate to? And in fact, this idea of bhakti yoga that I talked about here, this path of love and devotion, is connected to this because each person in this philosophy chooses who they feel that they can relate to, you know, certain characteristics which are based in mythological stories and epics. So each god has particular stories and characteristics that seem to resonate for different people. And so to me, this reflected this, you know, growing interest for me in object relations theory and how we might start to think about this as maybe there's something in common here between psychoanalysis and Hindu philosophy. Um, more recent psychoanalytic conceptions of religion have been influenced by the contributions of relational analysts. And this, this of course, moves um, us away from a two-person psychology, as it's been termed, into a more, pos into a more social constructivist lens of human relationships. Um, so while Freud was interested in understanding a universal sense of reality, relational analysts and intersubjective theorists uh, focus more on the development of a more of a personal sense of reality. The, relation, the relational approach involves inquiry into how a client seeks to connect with a therapist and know the therapist's inner world similar to the way that children see connection with their parents. Thomas Ogden has described intersubjective space between the client and the therapist as the analytic third where the subjectivity of the therapist and that of the client interplay through unconscious communication. The emphasis here on the interdependence of the observer and the observed in relational psychoanalysis places both the therapist and the client at the center of self-inquiry. At the same time, an introduction to a third intersubjective space in psychotherapy serves to structure roles and relationships of the client and the therapist and to moderate tensions that arise in dyadic relationships. But still, despite all these developments in psychoanalysis, religious belief and faith at, are still, in some ways, at best controversial among many psychoanalysts, in part due to psychoanalytic history itself. My informal conversations with colleagues on their spiritual lives have been wrought with both ambivalence about any lengthy dialogue on the subject and with frustration related to the perception that discussion of religion lies outside the purview of empirical science, thereby diminishing their self-images as objective, competent clinicians. So for me, really, it's only in the past 10 to 15 years within psychoanalysis, with the advent of postmodern and relational perspectives, that several prominent psychoanalysts, and I will use the word prominent again for a reason, I'll tell you why, um, that they've revealed in their writings their personal challenges with the interface of their psychoanalytic training and ideals and their own personal religious upbringings and spiritual 
discoveries. In a sense, they have been in a spiritual struggle themselves. Um, these analysts have not only discussed the lack of discourse on spirituality in their psychoanalytic training, but also their beliefs about the centrality of spiritual life to, their in, to the inner lives of their clients and to their own professional development. For instance, Rizzuto, Ana Maria Rizzuto, has described some aspects of her Catholic upbringing that parallel psychoanalytic approaches, including an object-related universe in which people are never alone. The experience of transformation related to confessing sins to a respectful individual and the need to confront reality and oneself honestly. That sounds a lot like psychoanalysis in some ways. Um, Alan Rowland has written about his own spiritual journey, including the study of Eastern meditative traditions um, and expressing feeling more comfortable over time with ambiguities. But I will say that all of these folks who've written about their own personal spiritual journeys within psychoanalysis and being psychoanalysts themselves um, have done so when they have achieved a certain level of professional credibility as psychoanalysts. They did not feel that they could talk really openly about their spiritual lives until they were well-known, well-established professionals um, and that they could be recognized for other contributions to psychoanalysis. Um, Another major challenge to the early psychoanalytic views on spirituality came from feminist discourse. Feminist theory challenges those who created and practice psychoanalytic theory and theology, highlighting the patriarchal structure that's inherent to both systems of thought. Feminist emphasis on mutuality in relationships is echoed in relational psychoanalytic perspectives, as are issues related to power, although the area of social, in, uh, social justice has largely been ignored until more recently in relational psychoanalysis. The issue of power is critical to understanding the meaning of spirituality in women's lives in particular. The effects of the belief in a powerful male god image or the reliance on male clergy or authorities in the interpretation of religious philosophy and doctrine on one's sense of identity and position in the world can be profound. Um, two researchers, Thunderbunk and Fukuyama, suggested that the invisibility of women in social structures of religious institutions contributes to what they call the spiritual wounding of girls and women. It's well noted that Freud's view of God involved a father representation. While Jung attempted to reintegrate feminine aspects of the God image, his notions of archetypal feminine convey female inferiority. Gendered images of God have been challenged by feminist psychoanalysts such as Julia Kristeva, who suggested that a maternal core exists within the imagery of God, but that the maternal core has been transformed into paternal symbolism within Christianity. Similar to other feminist psychoanalysts, Kristeva examines the psychological sources and meanings connected with the male image of God. And in a few minutes, I'll talk about a, a case of a client who identifies as Hindu who struggles with this image, the maleness of God. While feminism has focused on the importance of deconstructing patriarchal structure, its discourse has often assumed a value on Western individualism and the image of God as white. Menon and Schwader had described in their analysis of self-images of Hindu women in Orissa in India, the tendency of some feminist scholars who depict Hindu women as passive victims and blame the Hindu religion for the subordination of women. They also point out that the image of the Hindu woman as passive victim is sharply contrasted with the image of the Western or Westernized woman as educated, cosmopolitan, autonomous, and having control over her body. I would think the past few weeks and maybe the past couple years would challenge those notions. This lack of attunement to the complex interaction of racism, sexism, classism, heterosexism in the lives of racial and ethnic minorities has raised a significant la um, lack of trust of white feminism, similar to the mistrust of psychoanalytic psychotherapies by many racial and ethnic minority women uh, who, face who face experiences of multiple forms of oppression. An area that's overlooked in psychoanalytic literature on spirituality concerns the role of extended family and community on, uh, on our understandings of spirituality. 
Even in relational psychoanalysis, uh, there's little dialogue about the presence of a larger system or an ethnic community in a client's life. Lou Aaron had written about Freud's concern about the danger of the psychoanalytic movement potentially becoming a Jewish discipline. He pointed out that, ironically, Freud's study of human behavior was influenced by the traditional Jewish principle of interpretation, in which each letter of the Torah is thought to contain meaning and multiple interpretations. Freud's disavowal of his Jewish roots existed in the backdrop of the pre-Nazi era and was followed by several analysts who were forced to leave their countries of origin during the Nazi regime. So when we think about this, why is ethnicity, race, community, right? All of the different kinds of uh, sociocultural oppressions and trauma disconnected from how religion and spirituality is actually experienced. Increasingly, people are paying more attention to this. Um, so I want to move to talking a little bit about religious community and this meaning of religious community and subjectivity, the individual subjectivity, within the Hindu Indian immigrant context in the United States. Um, an individual's spiritual life involves a dynamic process of change across the lifespan, we all know that, as well as an interaction within certain sociocultural contexts. One example of this process is evident in the experience of immigrants. Immigration evokes various types of anxiety related to leaving one's country of origin, confusional anxiety in the new or unknown uh, cultural environment, and involves a multitude of trajectories with respect to acculturation. Immigrants may experience either a strengthening or a weakening of their identifications with their religious com communities or some vacillation from one perspective or an to another across the lifespan. For some immigrants, moving to a new country presents challenges in establishing connections with a religious community because, they're, because of the physical context and the realities. Do I have access to a temple where I live? Do I have access to a community of people who um, have this particular background that you see here. Um, others may experience ambivalence about recreating a religious community that resembles one in the country of origin. Um, it's important then to consider the relevance of the religious and spiritual community on one's subjectivity. Some people have access to a community, others don't or have less of it. God images are often connected with larger cultural notions of individuals' relationships with the outside world. For instance, in Hinduism, God representations contain both loving and fearful elements, sometimes extending to one's feelings about family members. The Hindu vision of God as manifested in various different forms implicates complex relationships among the God representations. So sometimes the stories that we um, have learned as children and as adults um, contain conflict among the gods, among different versions of God and layers of God. Um, this view of God is connected with broader Indian social values of interdependence on family and community. So it's not surprising then that most Hindu Indians experience religious practices and broader cultural identifications as inseparable. So if you were to ask me what makes you Indian versus Hindu, if you've grown up in a Hindu Indian family, it's hard to separate those two things out. I could point to particular traditions that we follow or festivals or certain religious practices, but identity, you know, if you were to ask me if I'm a woman first or a Hindu first or um, uh, a heterosexual person first, I couldn't tell you what comes first. They all coexist. They're intertwined and they're inseparable. This connection, though, between ethnicity and spirituality is shared by different ethnic minority groups in the U.S. as well. We know that this is a common experience. For instance, for many African Americans, spirituality has historical significance dating back to slavery, and the black church has been one of the most enduring institutions in African American communities. Under conditions of social and political oppression, communities often play a critical role by deconstructing oppressive ideologies and reconstructing trusting relationships. For many ethnic minorities, a critical strategy for surviving racial violence and oppression involves preserving a strong attachment to communities by relying first on the resources that those communities have to offer. So for many Hindus in the United States, the temple or a spiritual community becomes, or a Diwali celebration, um, you know, ends up being sort of the first place to go 
something familiar, something connecting, something that refuels one's identity. An individual's connection with religious and ethnic community can be highly varied, right? One can see how intense relationships with religious communities or religious authorities can contribute to the creation of ethnic religious identities often tied with political tensions across groups of people. Uh, Fayek had described religious identity of the analyst and the patient as either being personally based or ethnically based. So this I find very interesting because when we consider the transference and the counter-transference, um, and we think about, well, what are we feeling towards our client when they are speaking something and telling us something? Is it a personal thing or is it an ethnic thing? Can we sort of separate these things out, right? And maybe that's just not the right question to ask in the first place because the two are inseparable. And I always say um, that you know people should not be asking, do you think this is a cultural thing, you know? Of course it is, it's always cultural. There is no separation between the psyche and culture and social context. Um, so let me turn to speaking specifically about women um, and Hindu women. While spirituality and religion are linked closely together for many Hindu women, spiritual beliefs and traditions specific to the female experience can also be differentiated from organized Hindu religious doctrines and structures that form the post-Vedic era. Many Hindu women view spiritual faith as central to feminine identity and to the experience of personal power. The Vedic period is still influential. Hindu mythological stories of goddesses from this era provide important feminine images that are internalized by Hindu women. Goddess images that stem from um, this period reflect women's ideals of strength, power, devotion, intelligence, and nurturance. The emphasis on feminine power, or what's called shakti, is evident in the belief that the soul is both feminine and masculine. A physical symbol of spiritual strength and power is the bindi that's worn by many Hindu women on their foreheads, although in more recent times the bindi is also worn just for fun and decoration um, in, in some celebrations. The early Vedic Hindu emphasis on women's strength and devotion continues to pervade the lives of um, the inner lives of Hindu women. We grow up listening to stories about warrior queens and princesses who hold at times powerful and other times powerless positions in the course of important epics like the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. For example, in the Ramayana, Sita is described to have great spiritual power, equaled only by her husband Rama. Sita and Rama are thought to be incarnations of goddess Lakshmi and god Vishnu, respectively. And in the course of the epic, Sita is abducted by a demon king called Ravana. Her abduction is thought to be a source of a long battle that lasted many years between Rama and Ravana. And finally, Rama saves Sita. Sita's virtues of fidelity and loyalty to her husband are extolled by Hindu men and women in contemporary society. In a related vein, women in epics such as uh, in the Mahabharata, um, it's a, uh, women like Kunti are praised for spiritual devotion. Kunti was a, a widowed mother of five princes, the Pandava princes, and she is thought to achieve spiritual grace through her prayer and devotion to the god Krishna. Her sons are later protected by Krishna in a great war that ensues against their cousins over the ownership of their kingdom. So this notion that female devotion carries great power, in fact, it can save children's lives. Um, spiritual devotion is also connected with women's ability to provide nurturance to children and others. The Sanskrit names for elements like earth and rivers, earth water, are feminine. For instance, the, um, the Ganga River, or the Ganges River, is named after the goddess Ganga. And the earth is referred to as the goddess Budhevi, which symbolizes fertility and nurturance. For many Hindu women, the value of mothering is an essential component of spiritual devotion. Interestingly, mothering is also connected with increased social power and protection by other family members. In contemporary Hindu communities across the diaspora, women are actively involved in spiritual practices like prayer and meditations. Girls are taught that prayer would provide inner strength as well as material uh, success. 
They ha there has also been a resurgence of earlier Vedic philosophy that provides access to spirituality across gender and class by Hindu reformists and female gurus and teachers. In the US, there's been, there, there are now numerous Hindu spiritual centers where women participate in the teaching of Hindu spirituality and create spiritual communities. Um, so let me move a little bit to my personal experience. Um, spirituality, uh, of course, is you know, conceptualized very individually um, by clients and therapists. In terms of my own personal view, um, my view of spirituality is connected with my exposure to Hindu, Hinduism within my family and Hindu community, both in India early in my childhood and in the US. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Hinduism really can be conceptualized more as a way of life rather than a religion. Uh, while there are many paths that I mentioned um, to liberation, um, my interactions within my family emphasize prayer, this bhakti yoga, and service, so karma yoga, these two specific paths. And every family is different when it comes to this. Um, my interactions with extended family when, and with other Hindu Indians in the US has informed my knowledge of Hinduism and of the reality that faith can be understood in many different ways that are accepted within a family and a community. So I was born in India, and when I and I lived there until I was seven, and um, I remember very distinctively because we lived in a large city, um, a fairly cosmopolitan city called Hyderabad, and this is a city that I would wake up in the morning to first to uh, prayers from a nearby mosque, and then I would then wake up to my great grandfather's prayers, Hindu prayers in the house, and then I would go to a Catholic grammar school. So my day was really very, you know, I don't know, multicultural, and, <laughs> and, um, and exposed to so many different um, traditions spiritually. Um, and so as a child, I participated in prayer rituals taught by my parents. And as an adult, I had become, I had moved away from more from that bhakti yoga into thinking more philosophically. This, uh, this thing over here, actually I have this right up here, the path of knowledge, jnana yoga. So I would sort of shift in and out of different ways of trying to understand Hinduism. Um, and then go back to bhakti yoga. And so th this is very typical to sort of shift different path, um, pathways depending on where you are in your own life. Um, I've experienced a deepening of my faith in God and attempt to integrate my conception of Hinduism in my daily life with my family. More recently though, I have two sons one who has just turned 18 and the other who is 14. And so my 18 year old who just started college um, is individuating. And so I'm remembering my own process of leaving my family and engaging in reading the Bhagavad Gita and understanding my spirituality in a very different way than how I was taught at home before that. And I bring this up because this can be an incredibly challenging process within a family as children spiritually individuate. So when we talk about separation individuation, it is a cultural individuation, a spiritual individuation as well. It is not just about, I'm gonna leave now and I can vote. You know, it's not about that. It's about a psychological process that one embarks on for the rest of their life. And so this is a very deep and meaningful process between children and their parents. And I remember very specifically um, when my, well, more recently when my son had uh, his ears pierced and he wears two studs now and he and the, the, it's interesting because um, my parents would see this as well he's gotten so Americanized he wants to do all these trendy things and in fact when he went back and explained to them it's not a trendy thing that I'm trying to do but in fact I'm trying to reconnect with our ancestors in India people men wore earrings <laughs> and, and in fact um, my parents said well actually my grandfather and my great-grandfather all had earrings <laughs> and so it's very interesting how children negotiate um, you know this process of individuation but also connection and um, and staying connected and rediscovering themselves and their ancestry both culturally and um, and spiritually in the context of migration. Um, 
And I'm remembering my own individuation from my parents, where um, when I arrived to the United States, I was wearing a bindi to school every day. And I wore it every day um, well into high school. And one day I decided that it ha didn't have as the same kind of meanings for me that it did for my mother, and that I no longer wanted to wear it. And this was, a, this was very difficult for my mother. And I bring this up because these are the kinds of developmental processes that come with spiritual journeys. Um, and with the process of acculturation and immigration that really cannot be separated out. Is this an immigrant thing? Is this acculturation? Is this spiritual individuation? These are all intertwined processes. Um, okay. So as much as I have immersed in, this is where the ambivalence part comes in, as much as I have immersed in my own spiritual journey as a Hindu, um, I've also struggled with decontextualized interpretations of Hindu scriptures that devalue women. The role of women in Hindu culture involves contradictions. Um, on one hand, powerful female figures or forms of God are worshiped as are mothering aspects of these forms. On the other hand, women have been and continue to be excluded from holding powerful positions in larger religious structures, such as temples. Some scriptures explicitly describe women as either undeserving of power or as manipulative of men in the context of men's search for spiritual insights. We all grew up in our home listening to stories, mythological stories, where there would be a sage deep in meditation. And in fact, there are stories of Buddha, some stories of Buddha also deep in meditation where there would be a, a woman tempting him to come out of the meditation. So this woman as this manipulator. And so there were these narratives that existed in very contradictory ways. Um, and practices too that I couldn't make sense of in my uh, increasingly bicultural understanding of you know, being an American as well as an Indian. And one of these practices had to do with going to the temple or not going to the temple uh, when um, a, a girl or a woman has um, her menstrual cycle, her period. And so, and, and my parents would explain it to me as well, it started as a tradition where people, women were not feeling well during that period of time, so they were not required to go to the temple. And yet, over time, this practice became interpreted as well, you are contaminated, therefore you cannot go to the temple. You see how different these narratives are and profoundly hurtful to women and girls. But these types of contradictory messages about Hindu women without a doubt can play a significant role in personal spirituality. And I continue to pursue my own inquiry into my experience as a Hindu and ironically, it may be that the flexibility that's inherent in Hindu philosophy with respect to paths of self-realization that actually have contributed my ability to my ability to tolerate the confusing nature of women's positions. Interestingly, this perspective may have influenced the way that I've approached the complicated relationship between psychoanalysis and sociocultural realities. Psychoanalytic inquiry challenges us to tolerate the unknown in our clients' mental lives in an attempt to find meaningful insights into the true nature of the self. And it's at this juncture that I found common ground for my Hindu spirituality and psychoanalytic perspectives. So let me just share a couple of things and then I'll briefly mention a case vignette. And um, so these are some commonalities that I find as a psychoanalytic therapist and as a Hindu person, Hindu woman. Um, and as other presenters, everybody has spoken to this today in some respect that in fact, I don't think I could get to some of the material and some of the interaction with my clients if it, if it only relied on more traditional psychoanalytic thinking, but rather I needed something else. There was another dimension missing that was a part of me and my identity that I needed to bring into the work. Um, the, the first um, commonality has to do with the role of interpretation and the importance of this kind of flexibility that I'm talking about that I sort of acquired and internalized over the years around thinking that there could be multiple narratives here, you know? So if you look at any particular Hindu epic um, or you listen to a client, there are multiple narratives that we're listening to. There's mine, there's at least five or six you know, at any given time. And so how do you listen to all of these and sit with the unknown? 
Um, I also learned about, I also see as common, the importance of privacy. This cannot be, I think, overstated in psychoanalytic work in thinking about privacy, but also the importance of exploring that private space, the personal reality that one experiences, both in spirituality um, and in thinking about psychic work. Um, there's, there's also um, something about um, the guru-disciple idea that bears great relevance for me in thinking psychoanalytically, um, whereas the guru-disciple relationship in Hinduism is not just about the guru imparting advice and advising, but actually engaging in this dialectical process where you're uncovering a reality. You're uncovering some, that something that was unknown within the student and thereby transforms the student, but also the guru. You know, so there's a, there, there are two people, at least, that are being transformed in this process of learning. Um, so I want to share with you quickly a case, um, a vignette, of a, a woman, a young woman named Kavita. Kavita is a 23-year-old Indian American woman who sought psychotherapy on her own initiative to help cope with stress, anxiety related to her performance in graduate school. In her initial session, she reported feeling anxious about failing out of school, even though she completed her program requirements quite successfully. So this, it wasn't really matched with what was going on. She stated that she'd never felt this anxious before in her life, and she thought, I think that I'm just stressed out with my family, and that's what's making me feel so bad. She grew up in a middle-class neighborhood with her parents and her older sister, and she reported having a close relationship with the sister who she described as the good one in the family who followed, quote, a straight path, both socially and academically. She, she would say that her parents were loving, strict, and deeply religious. Her parents were actively involved in teaching Hindu philosophy at their local temple and were invested in their daughters learning this philosophy. At the same time, she explained, they were sort of like rebels in the community because they had two girls who knew just as much about Vedanta, the Hindu scriptures, as my uncles, the older men in the community. She felt strongly identified with her Hindu Indian community and at times deeply disconnected. In high school, she recalled feeling sexually attracted to other girls. She was silent about her feelings for several sub subsequent years, and when she got to college, she became involved in relationships with women, and in her third year, decided to come out to her family. And initially, her parents felt confused. They didn't really believe that she's a lesbian, um, so they lived in denial. Kavita's sister was apparently supportive of her, um, and this was helpful. So I worked with her, uh, with Kavita, for two years, and when I met her, her sister was engaged to be married to an Indian man, and her family was preoccupied with organizing a traditional Hindu wedding. And about a year prior to this, Kavita had disclosed to her parents her relationship with an Indian American woman. Her parents, while acknowledging the presence of this relationship, they told her that they were not ready to meet her partner. Kavita struggled with her feelings of disappointment with her parents' response, and she would describe her partner as someone who is Indian by birth but not by heart, referring to her partner's strong identifications with white feminism. Kavita mentioned that her partner also had a Western view of relationships that centered around her se the self instead of a commitment to one's family. She both admired and diminished her partner's apparent self-focus and expressed feeling guilty about her own personal conflicts instead of helping her sister with her wedding. Kavita's distance from her family, from, and from her parents and her partner were compounded by feelings of being alienated from her religious community. She would tell me, I can't stand it that I have to pretend like I'm not gay when I'm around my parents. I miss them, I even miss the temple, but I can't do anything about it until they accept this about me. And I responded to her one, at one point, asking her why she thought she couldn't tell anyone in the temple. And she said, I don't want to hurt my parents, and maybe they don't want, I don't want to feel like more people are ashamed of me or look at me differently. They don't even talk about sex in the community. How would I possibly talk about this? And to me, this resonated with my own experience within the Indian Hindu communities, where there was great taboos around talking about sexuality. And, um, and there was active diminution of women, certainly, who would express any aspect of sexuality outwardly. 
So I wanted her, to, I wanted to protect her from the potential reality that she may indeed further get isolated. And I also, at the same time, wanted her to reconnect with friends whom she deeply cared about. At times, she indicated how angry she felt towards God, who in her mind was masculine. In our discussions, she said, I know I should think of God as being male and female. I'm just so used to it. I mean, in Hinduism, gods are male and female. But I still have a hard time thinking of a woman god. And I found this point in our work critical in that she began to question her longstanding assumptions about both God and her position in the world. In other words, she began to wonder about the sources of these assumptions and the possibility of forming different self-images and God images. Her ambivalence about women having real power and agency in the world seemed to have mirrored her image of herself and possibly her image of me as a less powerful female therapist. So what was actually happening in the transference? I also believe that she experienced me in the transference as her parents and her partner at different times, symbolizing traditional and non-traditional Indian perspectives. She expressed her appreciation for being able to talk with me and her ambivalence about my challenging her to think more about her internalized aggressive and loving feelings about her relationships with people in her life and with God. In one session, um, when she was talking about her feelings of loss in her temple community, she said, I probably sound like some kind of fanatic. I'm really not. I mean, you wouldn't expect someone like me to be so religious. I was aware of how both of us were concerned about being perceived as either fanatic or atheist and our shared value of the presence of God in our lives. Thank you. So we move to some time of questions and answers, or questions and musings, however you want to think about it. And, um, the microphones are coming around, so uh, the floor is yours. Doctor, do you find a growing level of interest in Hindu spirituality coming about now, or are you going regressively? in terms of, of people's interest in, in Hindu spirituality. Is it oh, growing uh -huh, or is it uh -huh. in, in terms of in the United States? Yes, and in yeah. this particular area of England. Yeah, I, I see it growing in certain ways. It's very interesting for me because when we first arrived, we arrived in 1977 to New York City. And at that time, there were very few, there was very little access to practicing as a Hindu. Um, now it feels very different in large metropolitan areas, but if you move into certain suburbs or rural areas, it's still very little access. And so um, I think that there's a growing interest, but sometimes it feels commercial to me, you know, from my perspective, because sometimes I've walked into novelty stores and I see pictures of Ganesha on lunch boxes. You know, so there's this way in which I struggle with this, because on one hand, I don't know the authenticity of that interest, um, sometimes it is authentic to me, at least I experience it that way, and other times I see it as commodification. And I'm not sure what to do with that. Um, because for me, you know, growing up in India and in my family, I would never put a Ganesha on my lunchbox and carry like a ham sandwich or a bologna sandwich in it. It would just not happen. Um, so, you know, it was considered, so sometimes I feel that um, there are sacred symbols of Hinduism in the United States that um, get culturally appropriated, and um, and somehow that's more accepted, you know, in the general public than maybe other religious symbols from other religious traditions, um, where I think you would see sh much sharper criticisms, you know. Um, so I do think there's this kind of there's. A problem with that. However, there's also, as you all know, yoga is really big here, you know, and everywhere you go, you see yoga centers. Um, so it's really, you know, interesting to see some practices, um, you know, being adopted as something that's very useful and helpful. Um, so those those kinds of experiences feel more authentic to me. But sometimes, you know, then I walk into sort of yoga stores that feel like. You know, this, it's like this commercializing of something that I grew up 
you know, really having it be very sacred. And so for me, sometimes I struggle with this kind of removal of the, of the sanctity of those traditions. Um, you know, when you sort of import them without really talking to people about what, what those traditions mean to them. So it's a complex, you know, kind of feeling. Yeah. Thank yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your um, talk. It was extremely rich. And as I was thinking especially of um, accompanying someone in the process of kind of spiritual individuation and how important that is. And it, you didn't mention this at all, but I, I, I would love to have you reflect a little bit on um, maybe someone from a different religious tradition coming to you as a psychotherapist and taking their tradition very seriously. So I was kind of imagining, because of the value of community and the difficulty of really leaving a religious community or discerning your own relationship to it, I actually think it might have been more helpful for me to go to someone who understood that but wasn't in my own tradition, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So not going to a Christian psychotherapist but going to someone who would... So I'd love to hear you talk about working with a psychotherapist who takes spirituality very seriously but doesn't share the same tradition, what are the possibilities yeah, there you. for the work? Thank you for the question. Um, so if we think about this issue of spiritual individuation, it's a developmental process, right? So I find that with different clients, um, and if you think about any of us in the room, we are looking for different things at different times in our life. And so it's very possible that a client um, who's Hindu does not want to work with a Hindu therapist, you know, because often there's this feeling, this fear that the person will judge them or, you know, uh, see them as not authentically Hindu or whatever, you know, tradition it might be. Um, so certainly that's a valid reason to see somebody who is not, you know, of the same tradition. I have worked with um, many clients in different traditions, and um, and it's interesting because um, there's a way in which it, I think that the more you engage in your own spiritual journey as a therapist, you I find that it opens me up to listening to different traditions in a more open way, you know, in a more uh, in a way that's not just sort of relating myself to that experience or imposing my experience on that individual or that client, but rather that I'm, tr I'm just listening differently. You know, so this, this um, philosophy that I described that has this kind of openness to different narratives and interpretation, I think that actually helps me connect with um, different, you know, listen for different interpretations. Um, but I've had um, clients whom I've worked with that um, have asked me, or from different traditions that have asked me very directly, you know, do you believe in God? And what they want to know often is, can I relate to this or will I look down on this idea or dismiss it or not see it as central to their lives? Um, so there's some common, you know, truths to be found across those experiences. Um, and in some cases, um, Clients have asked me specifically, what do you believe in? You know, are you Hindu, Muslim, Christian, what are you? You know, in India there are a lot, a lot of different religions. Um, I don't wear a bindi, I don't wear anything that really kind of, you know, indicates my religious background. Sometimes people assume I'm a Hindu because they associate that with Indians, you know, more so than other religions. Um, so I've had all kinds of reactions and responses, I would say, uh, depending on wh where the person is. It's interesting, your question reminds me of this experience I had many years ago, probably about 10 years ago, when I um, saw the Dalai Lama. He did a talk when I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and um, it was the most peaceful experience, I have to say. And he, um, one of the questions he was asked was this question of, well, do you, if you resonate with a different tradition, would you, you know, would, would you encourage seeking out that tradition? You know, would you convert perhaps or, um, and w he said something really interesting that I'll never forget. He said um, that it's, it's fine to follow in the tradition you're already in because it's familiar to you, but why not deepen your understanding of it, you know? So it was very interesting that you don't have to necessarily convert to find yourself, 
you know, you can actually find yourself right where you are, in a sense, too. If you want to do that within a different tradition, it's fine, but you can also do that within. So it's a very interesting kind of, you know, question. I think there's a lot of assumptions people make that if I go to this therapist, they will understand me differently. You know, and it's not just regarding spirituality, but all kinds of things like race and gender and immigration, sexual orientation, and so on. Yeah. Hi, I first just want to hold some gratitude for the way you acknowledge spiritual experience as a source of knowing, um, both like the self and the other. I was so struck when you noted the fear of going native and couldn't help but wonder at the fear of being seen as fanatic at the end. Yes. Um, and just today, I was with a friend talking about Shabbat, and she looked at me and she goes, don't go orthodox on me. And so no. I'm just wondering at how psychoanalysis helps you, helps us understand this colonial terror of the native. Um, like, how do we understand that function that seems to go across religious divides, like this fear of being fanatic or extreme? Like, yeah. how does psychoanalysis help us navigate that, mm -hmm. um, both in and out of the clinical setting? Mm -hmm. Thank you, it's a great question. Um, I would say that psychoanalysis helps us think about the unconscious. What is driving us to think this way? You know, if we can sort of bring our unconscious bias, perhaps, into our awareness more, uh, more routinely, if we can acknowledge that we all have bias, for one, and not ex you know, assume that we're all enlightened and we have the answers, you know, that um, I do find that that helps. I, one, one aspect of psychoanalysis that I think I was able to learn from in a tremendous way that I couldn't necessarily have done so in my spiritual learning earlier uh, was this emphasis on unconscious processes. You know, what drives us to make those kinds of assumptions and what are our associations? Like, for example, if, you know, what is this person's image of an orthodox person or a fanatic or a fundamentalist or whatever that might look like? Um, and, and where is that person getting that message from? And why does, why does the person then need to project that towards you? You know, so it's an intrapsychic process, but it's also a relational process. Um, and so there, to me, that's where psychoanalysis can help us sort of deepen our understanding of, of those kinds of, um, you know, those dynamics, I would say. Yeah. Hi, I first wanted to thank you so much for sharing your personal experience of your own tradition. I really value that. I, I'm really fascinated with different worldviews and religions, and I try to read about them, but it's very different reading a book that may be, have been written 50 years ago and talking to another person. So I do try to talk to people. Um, and I was wondering if you could shed some light for me on something. It might be something personal about that person, or maybe it was something cultural that I don't really understand. So I have this friend who's not a super close friend, but I was trying to ask her some questions about her spirituality, and she seemed pretty open about it and very happy to answer questions. But then there seemed to be little places where it, it kind of like she wanted to shut it down, don't go there. Mm -hmm. So one of them was I asked her about the Bhagavad God, and um, she said, nobody reads that. That's just something that Hindu priests or, or the religious professionals read. That was one thing. And the other thing that she said, she had a great disdain for people who um, converted because she said, um, I think they're just trying to escape their caste. And, and so out of curiosity, I said, oh, what is your caste? Because I wanted to learn something about that. And she said, um, you need to no learn to mind your own business. <laughs> so I was just oh, curious yeah. where that yeah. comes from. Like, yeah. is it cultural? Was it something just personally her? Or am I walking into something that I shouldn't be walking into or asking it in the wrong way? Yeah, it's such a great question about caste in particular. Yeah, I started to sort of say a couple of things about it, but there's so much to say about caste. Um, caste is very interesting because I have noticed in my own clinical work with um, uh, many Indian patients, clients, that um, in early in my work, we never talked about caste. 
And I and then I started to wonder why are we never talking about caste? But we seem to talk about all these you know other very personal things. And um, and I've come to understand caste as an equivalent to race in America, that it's an incredibly shameful and shame-producing um, and destructive uh, social structure. And it is something that um, people have internalized and bring across the diaspora. Um, it's something that is so entrenched in Indian life today. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're a Hindu or not in India. Uh, so there are, in fact, the history goes that people did convert out of Hinduism into other religious um, traditions as a way of trying to escape caste, and particularly if they're coming from a Dalit or a lower caste. And, um, but those caste traditions were so entrenched and the mentality around in certain castes being inferior that no matter where that person converted to, um, it would still be tracked in a sense. And so it was not something that could be hidden. And so whether you're a person of a higher caste or a lower caste or somewhere in the middle, it is a shameful system. And it's, you know, so I've come to, over time, talk more explicitly about caste with my um, clients. But I understood it because I thought, why do people here have such a hard time talking about race? And I could never understand that. So we all have our life histories that present more challenging, you know. Um, issues because race is trauma, is traumatic in this country, caste is traumatic in India and within Hinduism. So I think that might have, that's one explanation. Um, but again, her interpretation, her explanation of the other things that you mentioned, it's so individual. It varies tremendously across families. Um, it's like if you talk to one person who's Christian and decide that that's Christianity, you can't do that, right, uh, with Hindus either. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Tamalinara. Thank you very much for your lovely presentation. Um, I was thinking you ref referenced uh, reincarnation and the development of the soul. Yes. And I was wondering how you um, incorporate that within your psychoanalytic practice and mm -hmm. the development of the self um, through the relational process. Yeah, if thank you. Can you can speak a bit more to that, please. Yeah, yeah that's a great question. So how does um, reincarnation sort of play itself out in the therapeutic work psychoanalytically. In my own theorizing, again, I see it as a developmental model, you know? And I see it more as um, a model of attribution, you know? So for example, I have clients who will say, um, this happened to me because I did this, you know, to somebody else, and it's coming back to me, it's my karma, you know? Um, or, and sometimes, it's explicit to a past life. I must have done something awful to deserve this suffering. You know, so these kinds of connections are made all the time because um, there's a way in which suffering is thought to be rooted in, in one's past actions. Um, at the same time, I, I like to try to deconstruct this, and this is the psychoanalytic part of me that wants to understand what that actually means for that person. Um, for some clients, uh, they, they look back on something like a traumatic event, you know, a childhood sexual abuse, intimate partner violence, and they might start attributing it, I did something to deserve this. And so this poses a deep dilemma for me. Really, did you really do something to deserve this, you know? And I have a lot of strong feelings about that that don't necessarily align with the, the client's explanation around karma and reincarnation, first because that's not my understanding or interpretation of reincarnation or karma. Um, I see it as far broader than those kind of you know, individual or interpersonal interactions. I, I have not learned about karma in that way, so it's not part of my personal understanding of it. But when it's interpreted in this very different narrative, then Sometimes I offer my own explanation and my interpretation, and I will say, do you know that different people interpret this differently? Even different Hindus, you know, <laughs> different people interpret this differently, but let me understand where you're coming from. Explain it to me. Let me help me understand this more. So there's this, you know, again, it becomes a dialectical process. It's not something that I'm going to agree with or disagree with um, in the interpersonal interaction, 
but I can share my narrative, and I, I feel very comfortable stating that. Thank you. Very, very interesting presentation. I'm, I'm curious. You mentioned uh, Rizzuto's work and how uh, and she has a couple of papers out that are really fascinating descriptions of uh, God representations that are at war with each other. Yes. And you know, you talked about within Hinduism of having uh, a, a unidimensional understanding of God, but also multi-layered understanding of God. And to, I just wondered to what extent do you come across God representations or images that clash and collide among Hindus? And, and it seems to me to be a natural kind of point of connection with psychoanalytic thought. It is, yeah, it is a natural point of connection with psychoanalytic thought. So I'll give you an example, um, the, the story that I was telling you, the mythological story in the Ramayana about Sita and how she's seen as an equal to her husband, Rama. And they're both thought to be incarnations of one part of the Trinity. And, um, and so it's interesting because it's very typical in conversations, social kind of dialogues and social situations, parties, whatever, um, that people talk about this as a dilemma because Sita on one hand is seen as equal. On the other hand, when she um, is rescued by her husband from this demon king and she returns home, there are people in the kingdom um, they're king and queen, and um, they're people in the kingdom who question her purity, her sexual purity, because she's been away for years and years with this, abducted by this man. And, um, and, and so she is faced with this dilemma of having to defend herself, but really her husband, being the king, has to, he's faced with the dilemma of listening to his subjects the people he is supposed to listen to and respond to, and he is thought to be the ideal king. So what happens is that um, she, is, uh, she has a test of walking through fire to see if she is indeed pure. So you have this position you know, that completely switches from being equal to being unequal and less than. And so it's very common um, among you know, social circles and in the analytic situation to think about these as dilemmas. How is it that we can have these contradictory positions and narratives? You know, and sometimes clients will bring up these stories and they will talk about, um, I want to be like the ideal wife, like Sita was. And Sita is a very, it's, she's a, a, a very important reference point for many Hindu women. Or I will find sometimes a younger client who will say, you know, my parents want me to be that, but I'm not that, you know. And they're struggling with very contradictory bicultural sorts of conflicts around gender roles and positions of gender. Um, but it's interesting how it comes up. These stories are internalized and so common that they come up as points of reference for those internal conflicts around who do I want to be and who am I and who is the person that is my partner or my significant other, whoever. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you again for the wonderful presentation. Um, I'm wondering how you reconcile the apparent tension between alleviation of suffering that is so much part of psychoanalytic psychotherapy, certainly in this country and in the West in general, and is part and parcel, and, and parcel of the medicalized um, approach to psychotherapy, right? The medical necessity. So how do you reconcile the tension between alleviation of suffering and the role of suffering as part of pursuit of liberation, right, within Hinduism, right? And perhaps the idea, the idea that, if I understand this correctly, is built into Hinduism that suffering in this life is, has a meaning for reincarnation in the next life and, and mm -hmm. should not be prevented, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really great question. So this idea of suffering in Hinduism is seen as a very natural part of life. You know, it's not something necessarily that can be eradicated, but it has to be sat with and worked through, you know, and these different paths help us um, achieve some relief of that suffering, but they don't necessarily eradicate suffering. And the, the way I see that as 
aligning with psychoanalysis is really, it dates back to Freud, because Freud's view was not one where he thought that we should just get rid of suffering. You know, suffering was not something to be eradicated, but it was rather something to be delved into and understood. And so I do think in our medicalized model, we have a real conflict with that, because we're looking to kind of alleviate suffering immediately. And sometimes I have to say, um, since I work with a lot of survivors of trauma, that um, we don't want to hear those stories, you know, as a society, and that sort of translate to how that translates to how we think are what we think are our best practices, you know. So I don't think our um, our move towards kind of quickly getting rid of symptoms is really helping us sit with these narratives that I think is so deeply important to um, to so many people, particularly survivors of trauma. Um, I had, you know, recently I was in a seminar that focused on um, women survivors of commercial sexual exploitation, trafficking, and one of the survivors talked about how she went to see a therapist, and this was a huge step for her to even get to a therapist. When she got there, um, she um, was, after years and years, was kind of ready to finally tell somebody what was happening, and this was so difficult. And when she got there, she started to tell this therapist about her story. She delved into it. And the therapist literally had a stopwatch around her neck, and the alarm went off at a certain time. And that was the end for her. That was the end for the survivor of going to see a therapist. But we can understand this not just as a therapist, as somebody who's unempathic. And this is a systemic problem that we have in really trying to listen, you know. Um, and understand suffering. So I, to me, there's not too much to reconcile in terms of psychoanalysis and, it, and what lies as its roots, because it's very much aligned with how I think about suffering as a Hindu in that way. Yeah. Well, I think we've reached the end. Okay. So will you thank Dr. Small Rao? Thank you.